Autolite and its 98,000 dealers bring you Mr. John Hodiak in tonight's presentation of Suspense. Tonight, Autolite presents the story of two men who could really talk, a young man and an old man. Naturally enough, they were liars. They also happened to be bank robbers. The story is based on fact and called The Big Heist. Our star, Mr. John Hodiak. Well, hello there, Sheriff. Oh, hello, Harlow. Say, now, ain't that Autolite staple the best battery that ever set a car perkin? <laughs> well, it sure is, Sheriff. The Autolite staple is the famous battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. It's the battery with fiberglass retaining mats protecting the power of every positive plate to reduce shedding and flaking and give that great battery longer life, as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Who says different, Sheriff? Why, nobody, Harlow. I just can't find nobody as needs convincing about the Autolite staple. You're so right, Sheriff. So, friends, visit your nearest Autolite battery dealer. He services all makes of batteries, and he has an Autolite stay full for your car. To quickly locate him, call Western Union by number... And ask for me, Operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer, where you can get an Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite presents The Big Heist, starring Mr. John Hodiak, hoping once again to keep you in suspense. Yeah, sure. I work with John Barry on the Colfax National Trick. He's the best in these bank bits, you know. Of course, everybody knows that. He had it cased right up to where he could tell you what the guy in small loans had for breakfast that morning. If it was a John Barry job, you can figure it was first class. Good. Right. Know what I mean? Uh, yeah, I believe I will. Thanks. Much obliged. You see... I'd been hanging around that pool room for a week or so, knocking off this one and that one, picking up enough to get by on. It was, uh, let me see, four days ago. Thursday. This bald-headed gent had been sitting there a half hour or better watching me practice. I'd seen him around before. I knew he'd get up and talk to me pretty soon. What's the matter? Uh, that's pretty good. Just luck. Uh, don't kid me. I'm not. You like eight ball? Well, I'm willing to try anything. Swell. Play for a buck? I don't know. What's the matter? Have you got a buck? I'm looking at the way you picked out that cue. You must be pretty good. Ah, I'm no good at all. Now, let's hold off playing for a buck right now. Just a friendly game. Oh, well, suit yourself. But you'll be sorry when you see how I play. I'm really no good. You wait, you'll see. He was a lollipop. If he'd thrown away the cue and used a baseball bat, he'd done better. Every shot, I thought he was going to tear the felt right off the table. But I let him win the first four games, and I could tell he felt pretty good about it. I miscued and passed up shots that a ten-year-old kid could have figured. I only had five bucks to my name, but I knew I was going to have at least 25 of his before I finished running. Okay, this will only take a minute. Uh-oh. All of you, over against that wall. Come on, let's hustle it up. Come on, boys, let's not waste a lot of time. Hey, what's up? Looking for vags, I guess. Huh? Getting a road gang together. They like to pick up anybody who needs a shave. Uh-oh. Come on now, you two, get over here. Right against the wall, boys. That's it. Let's knock off the chatter, huh? Just keep it quiet. I want identification on all of you. Driver's license, social security card, something that'll tell us what your name is, where you live, and where you work. Take them out. Come on, boys. Hey, I'm in trouble. Huh? No address here. Boy, you are in trouble. Shut up, darling. How many times have I got to... This your address, Barney? 21216? Yes, sir. What kind of work do you do? I'm a bricklayer. Where do you work? Masterson Construction Company. Why aren't you working today? I'm sick. Okay. Let's see it. No, not the wallet, just the card. Hmm. Carl Weisenbach? Yeah. Work, Carl? No, just sort of passing through town. You can see I live in Philly. I can see. How do you live, Carl? 
I saved my money. This one. Okay, come on. Hey. Uh, you know what it's all about. Oh, no, Let's have it, buddy. James Scott? That's right, Sergeant. What's this Salt Lake City? Well, that's where I lived. Uh, he's uh, with me now. We live together at 516 Marion Dale, <clears throat> number 14. What's your name? Martin Collins. What kind of work do you do? I'm an electrician. Yeah. Well, what do you do? I help him. I'm learning the trade. Here? In this place? Oh, a guy's got to relax, Sergeant. <laughs> we just finished a big wiring job for an outdoor billboard outfit. Why? Right. Seventeen days hanging by our toes on those things. You try it sometime. Uh, right? And this is our first day off since the beginning of last month. All uh, right? You betcha. That's the truth, Sergeant. Okay, here. You. Uh, where do you work? Man, I own this place. That's where I work. Uh, thanks, Cullen. Ah, uh, don't Where's mention it, life? Scotty. <laughs> That's about the way it started. Collins turned out to be a little quicker than I first sized him up. I could have talked my way out of it, I guess, but then he just might have saved me ten days for no visible means. After the cops talked to everybody and hauled a few down, we went back to the table. Well, that's that. Hey, aren't you going to let me get even? You'd never get even with me, boy. What? <laughs> had me picked, didn't you, Scott? Just like that bus driver you had right here on the same table three days ago. Why? Oh, you were going to let me win the first four. Then you were going to turn into a regular woolly hoppy and really let me have it. <laughs> it had gone up from a buck to five, then ten. Isn't that the way you're going to work it now, huh? Well, I'd just like to try for my three bucks again. <laughs> Come on, boy. Who you kidding? Own up now. <laughs> okay. I had you picked. <laughs> I could still give you a game, though. I tell you, I invented the game. You'd be wasting your time. You have been wasting your time. Have I? <laughs> Five, ten, fifteen bucks a day around here. Not bad, I'd say. How could you go for ten thousand bucks in one day, huh? Sounds good. But you'll have to lend me some overalls, because I know I'm going to have to work real hard for that kind of money. We need a third guy. For what? You want to meet somebody? Sure. Why not? Hang up your cue, boy. John Barry. Hello. This is Jim Scott, John. Hiya. Come on in, Jim. Tell me where you come from. Salt Lake City. Nice place, Salt Lake. How long you been in town? A week or better. Uh, what are you doing in this part of the country? Well, I don't know if I... Have oh, I it isn't going to hurt you. Just answer questions, Scott. Go on, tell him. You sit down, son. Sure. Thanks. I just like to know a little about the people I work with, that's all. Now, again, what are you doing here? Looking for work, I guess. I drove a truck on my last job. Do you know anybody in town? A couple of people. Who? Oh. oh, girl named Melva. We sort of uh, got acquainted. A week in town and you already got yourself a girl. That's good, isn't it, Martin? Ah, pretty good, John. Well, you're a personable young fellow. You have a nice way about you. I don't see why not. Can you use a little money? Well, uh, he said something about $10,000. That's not a little money. It might be a lot more than that. At least ten. Well, sure, I could use it. What do I have to do, hold up a bank? No, I'll do that part of it. You just help me. Huh? Yes, it's a bank job. You ever hear me, son, John Barry? No. Well, I'm the best in the business, and I always pick good men to work with me. Now, you look like the kind of boy who knows how to use his head. I'd like to have you in on it. You'll probably go far in this world. Not sticking up a bank, I won't. I'll go to jail. That's what'll happen. I thought you looked him over, Martin. I did, John. It's a surprise to me. Would you rather hang around those pool rooms the rest of your life? Oh, I've never done anything like a bank. What have you done, son? Thirty days. Uh, Ninety days once, and I didn't like it. Oh, I see. And I don't blame you. But no policeman's going to bother you on this. You aren't going to wind up in any jail. Nobody's going to jail. You do your part of it exactly the way I show you, and you come out clean, safe, nice and rich. Now, how does that sound? Oh, it sounds pretty good. How about that uh, girl, um, Melva? Yeah, that's her name. She pretty? Sure. Well, she likes you, I'll bet. Huh, Martin? Yeah, sure. Now, you and I both know that one thing ladies understand is money. The more you have, the more they understand. It's the way they're built. 
Isn't that the way it is, Martin? Sure is, Joe. And you know that too, son. Now, the money you get from this would help you a lot. Oh, maybe you wouldn't want to spend it on her. But then at your age, a good fling is something to remember all your life. A new car, nice place to live, things like that make this old world not such a bad place to live in. Maybe you'd even like to go into business. Well, I thought about that, too. Sure you have. When the whole thing's over, you'll never see Martin here again. You'll never see me again. But you'll have a big package of money to remember us by, to do with what you like. And I can tell by looking at you right now that you have some pretty good ideas on how to handle money. Now, isn't that right? Well, what would I have to do? I just pay attention to what you told, Scott. Martin's right. Years from now, somebody might ask you, or you just might want to tell them. You can say you were with John Barry on the bank job. You can say you started when it was low needle and you wrote it all the way. Of course, uh, if you don't want to work with me, you can walk right out that door and forget we ever talked about this. But when you read in the papers about how it went off and how much was taken, you'll feel pretty silly passing it up. Now, if you can use the money and follow instructions, Mutt and I would like to have you in on it. Wouldn't we? Ah, we sure would. Well, when when are you going to do it? Tomorrow afternoon. Do you want to help us tip over this bank, or, or don't you? What do you say? <clears throat> 10000 Probably a lot more. Are you in, son? I'm in. Autolite is bringing you Mr. John Hodiak in The Big Heist. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. No, Harlow, I really go for that Autolite stay full battery. Well, millions of motorists do, Sheriff. They all agree that for power, dependability, and convenience, you just can't beat the battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And don't forget, it has a life longer than a Texas Panhandle. That's because every positive plate in the Autolite stay full is protected by fiberglass retaining mats to reduce shedding and flaking for longer life as proved by tests conducted according to accepted life cycle standards. Yes, sir. That Autolite staple is top for my money. And your Autolite battery dealer is tops when it comes to servicing all makes of batteries. And he has an Autolite stay full for your car if a replacement is needed. To quickly locate him, call Western Union by number... And ask for Operator 25. I'll tell you the name of your nearest Autolite battery dealer where you can get an Autolite stay full. The battery that needs water only three times a year in normal car use. And remember, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. And now, Autolite brings back to our Hollywood soundstage Mr. John Hodiak in Elliot Lewis's production of The Big Heist, a dramatic report well calculated to keep you in suspense. This bird who built the Colfax National had a pretty nifty idea. He uh, set it back off the street so you can just shove your car right up in front of the place like it was a drive-in. No parking problem. There's plenty of room all the time to get in or out. And I guess that's the main reason John Barry fixed it. Uh, uh, just a minute, Scott. Huh? Relax. Well, I thought we were going in and look the place over. It's been looked over. I've been at it for the last eight months. Oh, okay. See that guard in front, son? Uh, the one looking at us? He's looking over us, son. He's watching that big clock across the street. He always does. Huh? For some reason, two minutes mean a lot in that man's life. The clock across the street runs two minutes fast. There are clocks on all four walls of the bank that are right on the nose. But when it gets near quitting time, he goes by that clock in front of the jewelry store. Now, in about 30 seconds, he'll rope off the front doors of the bank, and no more customers will be allowed in today. You'll have to keep him busy out there tomorrow. You're worried about one guard out front? Well, what about all those tellers and clerks inside? Must be 25 of them. There's 33 people inside that bank. Well, who's going to keep them busy while I'm keeping him busy? Suppose one of them wants to turn yeah, in yeah, on yeah, You're asking too many questions, Scott. Why don't you just listen? That's all right, Martin. I don't want to worry about anything. Son... There are only four tellers inside that bank who'll know it's being robbed. We'll be ten blocks away before the rest of them find out. Yeah, but I can see five cages in there. That's right. We only have to worry about the first four. The fifth one won't be working tomorrow. He's a war veteran with a hero complex. The only one in the whole bunch who'll try for the alarm. 
But we're lucky. The poor man has a spinal injury. Every Friday afternoon, he leaves at 2 o'clock to go over to the Veterans Hospital on Brainbridge Boulevard for outpatient treatment. They just close his cage. He uh, hurt bad? Anything in the spine's bad. Yeah. What did they tell you? The guards are open off the door. Two minutes to three by the bank clocks. Three o'clock by that one over there. You and I'll park the car here tomorrow at five minutes to three. I'll already be inside the bank waiting for John. Martin goes in at 2.45. I meet him inside at two minutes to three. Martin covers me while I work the cages. At three, by that clock across the street, you'll go up to that guard and keep him busy. I don't want him to turn around or worry about anything that's going on inside. You understand, son? Yeah, yeah, sure. You'll have to keep him busy for at least three minutes. Well, how? You talk pretty good, Scotty. That's why we picked you. Uh, Martin's right, son. You just go up to him and say anything you like, so just so you keep him busy. This time tomorrow, you'll be a pretty well-set young fella. Doesn't that make you feel good, son? I don't know where I got the notion that a bank robber always wore a dark suit and pulled a hat over his eyes. It was pretty hard to convince myself that an old guy, a fat guy, and me were going to heist the Colfax National. But when we got back to the hotel room and John Barry began telling me all he knew about the insides and outsides of that bank and the people who ran it and the people who built it and the people who owned it, I began to get a lump in my throat for the bonding company. He had diagrams. He had blueprints. He knew the alarm system better than the Ginzo who put it in. And uh, there's a certain safe company back in Ohio that'd make him a vice president tomorrow for what he could tell him about their own time vaults. But until eight that night, he kept me busier than a flea on a fat man telling me about everything. I felt pretty good about the whole thing. And I was just getting ready to go up to the room he rented for me when it happened. Here you are, son. Go ahead, son. Take it. It's yours. Wait, you didn't say anything about a gun. I thought all I had to do was talk to that guard. That's right, son. But I'm giving you this right now. I want you to have it. Well, 45. Uh-huh. Fine piece, that. Is it loaded? Oh, yeah. Uh, you better go upstairs and get yourself some sleep, son. Big day tomorrow. Yeah. I guess you're right. I'll tell you this right now. That gun was something I hadn't counted on. John told me I wouldn't have to use it. Just the same, it worried me. You know, I just wasn't used to it. I went up to my room and tried to call Melva, but she was out. I lay down a while and I couldn't sleep somehow. So I just went for a walk, thinking about everything. And I had the gun with me, right in my pocket. It was almost midnight when I got back. I didn't go to my room. I went right to his... He was lying on top of his bed in the dark. But his eyes were wide open and he had all his clothes on. An old guy, smoking his cigar, listening to the radio in his window. Is that you, son? Yeah. Pretty music, huh? Very nice stuff, that man wrote. Yeah. Look, John... I'm out. Out of the job, son? Yeah. Here's your gun back. I don't want it. I thought of just scramming out, but I wanted to tell you because you've been good to me today. I see. Mind if I ask you what made you change your mind about tomorrow? Oh, I don't know what it was. I I just decided not to, that's all. Uh Got the coffee, John. Ah, thought you're in bed, Scott. Martin, Scott says he isn't going with us tomorrow. Why? That's right. And there's no sense in you getting steamed up about it. I'm just not going to do it. What's the whole thing in a shell hole? Now, look, Scott, we've got to have you on this job. It's too late to get anybody else. John spent eight months laying it out. It's fixed for tomorrow afternoon. No, no, Martin, just a minute. Scott's a pretty good boy. We both know that. If he has a reason to back out and quit, it must be a pretty good reason. Isn't that right, son? Yeah. You see, Martin, he's thought it over. Oh, but, John, if it doesn't come off the way we planned it... Wait a minute, Martin. Son. What? I'd like to ask you again. Why? Why? Well, well, I just don't want to. Is it the gun, son? Is that it? Well, I don't want to shoot nobody. Oh, well, no. <laughs> Martin, have we ever shot anybody? No. You see, son, no sense in worrying about that. 
Now, Martin carried a gun for, what, uh, 11 years, Martin? Ah, at least that. Never fired it. Martin, show him your gun. Sure. Say, practically rusted, isn't it? Now, I've carried one for 22 years. Never had occasion to use it at all. When I gave you that gun tonight, son, I just thought I was going to make you feel good, honestly. Well, you didn't make me feel good. I see that now. But believe me, I just gave it to you as a sort of insurance. You don't even have to carry it if you don't want to. But uh, look here, uh, you take it back. Go ahead, keep it tonight. If you don't want to take it tomorrow, that's all right. Now, how's that? Well, I... You go upstairs and get a good night's rest, sir. You don't have anything to worry about. Tomorrow we'll all have a big breakfast and forget this ever happened. We left the hotel at 2.20, and we dropped Martin Collins six blocks from the Colfax National. He was to take a streetcar up there. After that, John Barry and I drove around to kill 12 minutes. At 2.45, we headed for the bank ourselves, and we pulled up in the lot at exactly seven minutes to three. You'd have thought I'd been through a dozen of them the way I felt. And then, just like that, it started. You all right? Well, may- maybe I can't keep him busy for three minutes. What then? No, no, no. Take it easy. Cause you can keep him busy. Talk to him. You know how to do that. Well, but what if I can't? Now, look. That guard's name's Edward Jameson. He makes $68 a week standing there looking at that clock across the street and telling people why they can't come in once he's put the rope up. That's the big moment in his life. It's the only thing he's got to live for. Play on that, sir. Yeah, yeah, but suppose... Here. He... You forgot this. Hey, oh, no, no, no. I, I left that back in my room. Yeah, I know, and so I brought it in case you might need it. Slip it inside your coat. Well. That a boy. All right, on time. Go after him as soon as he puts up the ropes. I don't want this thing. Son, that man's got to be busy. If you can't keep him busy talking, you shove that thing right under his nose. It'll look terrible to him, even bigger than it is. Remember, he doesn't want to get all shot up. Good luck. Yeah. After hours. You mean it's three already? Afraid it is. There's the clock. Well, that must be fast. I, I got two minutes out. I guess you're slow, sir. Well, you couldn't sneak me in, I suppose. Strictly against the house rules, no, sir. Well, look, one customer more or less isn't going to make any difference, is it? I'm sorry. Once the rope's up, I can let them out, but I can't let them in. Well, this sure puts me in a spot. Mm, is it a deposit? No, I have a piece of property going through escrow now. Now, I just found out the man I sold it to is declaring bankruptcy. Escrow's up at 10 tonight, and I don't want him to have my property. Would you? Oh, I should say not. Well, look, if, if you could just let me in there to talk to the escrow people, I can get myself out of a lot of trouble. What do you say? Well, I think I can help you. Good. I'll appreciate it. Now, look. Mr. Evers, head of the escrow division, is here until 5. Now, the operator is supposed to... I was looking over his shoulder, past him, inside the bank. I could see John Barry in front of one of the teller's cages, helping himself to a bag full of money. Martin Collins was standing right in the middle of the lobby, his right hand stuck down inside his coat pocket. Every one of the tellers were looking at him with a sort of wide eye, like they couldn't believe it. Old John was nudging somebody in front of him. Looked like a vice president. And they just kept going from cage to cage where he'd pick up the cash. Nobody made a move. I don't think any of the customers that were in there or anybody else outside the tellers knew the place was being robbed. Well, what is it? Aren't you going to call Mr. Evers? Huh? Well, what are you looking... Move back! Hey! Back! Or I'll let go! Look, are you crazy? Oh, my God! What happened, Scotty? Why'd you shoot him? It just went off! It just went off! Get out of here, boys! I didn't mean to shoot him! I didn't want to shoot him. You guys know that, don't you? All right, shut up, Scotty. I didn't want to. Honest, I didn't want to. I didn't want to do any of this. You guys made me do it. You taught me to do it. That's what you did. And I'm going to tell them, too. I'm going to tell them everything you made me do, and then they won't do anything to me. Never mind, my dear. What? Over there. He's got a gun on us. Wow. Hey, they're coming. That's right. And you can tell them anything you want. All right, All of you. All of you. Come out of that car one at a time. Put your hands up. Well, suppose I should never have given him the gun, Martin. I suppose so, John. Come out or we'll open fire. Come on, son. 
Let's see what these police officers want to talk about. This John Barry, and remember, he's the best... Looked like any old geezer you'd find filling prescriptions behind a drugstore counter or, or reading books in a public library on Sunday afternoons. But let me tell you, he had it. Every time he opened his mouth, he made sense. He was pretty good at that old chatter, too. In fact, I'd say he was just about that much better than me. Suspense. Presented by Autolite. Tonight's star, Mr. John Hodiak. This is Harlow Wilcox speaking for Autolite. And here once again is our star, John Hodiak. Well, John, it was good to have you back on Suspense after a long absence. Thanks, Harlow. And thanks to Autolite for inviting me. Suspense is truly radio's outstanding theater of thrills. And I consider it a privilege to be a part of it. And, John, it's satisfying to be a part of the Autolite family, for Autolite is one of the great names in American industry. Indeed it is, Harlow. World's largest independent manufacturer of automotive electrical equipment, the Autolite family includes 98,000 distributors and dealers in the United States and thousands more in Canada and throughout the world. Well, no wonder I find Autolite service wherever I go. Right you are, John. And friends, remember, every Autolite product is backed by constant research and precision built to the highest standards of quality and performance. So, from bumper to tail light, you're always right with Autolite. Next week, the story of a man who had everything to live for and committed murder to prove it to himself. The story is called Joker Wild, and our stars will be Kathy and Elliot Lewis. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis, with music composed by Lucian Morrowick and conducted by Lud Bluskin. The Big Heist was written for Suspense by E. Jack Newman. In tonight's cast, Herb Butterfield was John and Joseph Kearns, Collins. Featured in the cast were Junius Matthews, Charles Calvert, Ted Bliss, Bert Holland, and Jerry Hausner. John Hodiak is currently appearing in Allied Artists' Battle Zone. Remember next week, Kathy and Elliot Lewis in Joker Wild. You can buy Autolite Stayful Batteries, Autolite Electrical Parts, and Autolite Resistor or Standard Type Spark Plugs at your neighborhood Autolite dealers. Switch to Autolite. Good night. 200%. That's how much mail volume increases during the holiday season. If you want to be certain that packages and greetings reach their destination before Christmas, mail early. Mail now. This is the CBS Radio Network.